Yes, it's time to get real. Hi, this is Ace of the Bartender. You know me. Pastor Jay has asked me to invite you all to join us to get real here at the Ecclesia Cafe Piano Bar. And uh, here is Pastor Jay. And we're continuing on now. And this is number 50. And the title of this is Touch Me. <laughs> Here's a little background of the city Jesus and his disciples will visit again. They're going to go there again. Bethsaida is one of the most frequently mentioned towns in the New Testament. With at least three Peter, Andrew, Phillips of the Twelve Apostles born there. This is hometown for three of them. It is a place where Jesus performed several of his major miracles, walking on water, healing the blind man, if you remember that, and feeding the multitudes. We do have a picture. I think maybe you can see it if it comes up. Here is Bethsaida, and this is the northeast coast of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, looks kind of like Lake Tahoe without trees. <laughs> but... Uh, a beautiful place. It is a place where Jesus performed all these miracles we talked about. If you can imagine the 5,000 people out there eating the bread and the fish and, and these things. But unlike many other well-known cities of antiquity, Bethsaida was never rediscovered by modern 20th century archaeology. In fact, the site was of such importance because of its relevance to Jesus, his ministry, that it was believed to be a mythical city. Not a musical city, a mythical city. In 1987, that was too long ago, 1987, for some of us older people, an Israeli archaeologist undertook to determine if a 21-acre site located at about two kilometers from the northern coast of the Sea of, of Galilee was indeed Bethsaida. His conclusions were promising, but more work had to be done. In 1990, even closer, several of his colleagues from around the world joined the project. In addition to uncovering the Hellenistic Roman city of Bethsaida, a surprise discovery happened in 1996, even closer. The remains of an Iron Age city gate complex. An Iron Age city gate complex. It is now believed by some that the Iron Age Bethsaida was the capital of the kingdom of Geshur. Geshur is notable in the Hebrew Bible for its visits by King David and his marriage to the daughter of, of the king of Geshura. Well, let's go to our systematic, chronological, word-by-word, precept-by-precept study of the Gospels now, where today we see Jesus and his disciples visiting Bethsaida again. Let's go to NIV, Mark. 8.21 It says, They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. Touch him. 23. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside of the village. So you can see that there was a village there, if this was Bethsaida, but we didn't see it on the map. When he had spoken in the man's eyes and put his hands on him. Jesus asked, Do you see anything? 24. He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. 25. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, See, he came came out of the village. He says, don't go into the village. But then he didn't want the people to see what he was doing again. Okay, Bethsaida was mentioned by Jesus along with Capernaum in Matthew's writings in Matthew 11, 21 through 24. 
at cities where miracles had been performed. But not much repentance happened there. Let's go to New Living Translation, Matthew 11, 21. It says, What sorrow awaits you, Chorazin and Bethsaida? For if the miracles did in you had been done in the wicked Tyre and Sidon, remember we were just there a couple of teachings ago, Tyre and Sidon, their people would have repented of their sins long ago clothing themselves in burlap and throwing ashes on their heads to show their remorse. 22. I tell you, Tyre and Sidon will be better off on Judgment Day than you. 23. And you people of Capernaum, will you be honored in heaven? No. You will go down to the place of the dead. For if the miracles... I did for you had been done in the wicked Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, it would still be here today. Hmm. So that lightens up a little bit on Sodom and Gomorrah, huh? 24. I tell you, even Sodom will be better off on Judgment Day than you. So this place for say is Bethsaida. Jesus is saying that Sodom's going to be better off. So should we be surprised at what a mess the world that we live in is in today? God knows our hearts. And he has a plan where we will be brought to our knees one day soon and confess his lordship with all our hearts, souls, minds, and strength. This is what we're facing today. We're looking back at all these years in the past. Usually when we're reading the Bible, that's all we're doing is looking back, which is good because from the history, from, from the past, we can learn about the future. We believe the things, that the, the prophecies of the past. Why can't we believe the prophecies of the future? No matter how hard we pray or how little we, uh, we pray now, it is finished. Jesus said that on the cross. The plan and law is finished. Although one may desire to change the set times and laws someday, Daniel prophesied about this during that time when Israel was in bondage in Babylon. It was a prophecy about today, or as some believe, in the not too distant future. Who are these some who believe that? Hmm. Some people don't. <laughs> Daniel is speaking of a horn, a power, horn or a power. We understand to be the coming Antichrist, who will come against God, the Most High, and oppress the saints. That's us. Or those who would be in the days of the tribulation, here about the last seven years, which Daniel says, a time, times, and half a time would be the last seven years. Let's turn to the Old Testament prophecy to get this correct. Daniel 7, 23. He gave me this explanation, Daniel said. The fourth beast, the fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it, 24. The ten horns, the ten horns that the king saw, are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. There's going to be ten kings in this kingdom. After them, another king will rise. Ah, another one coming up. Different from the earlier ones. So this would be the Antichrist. He will subdue three kings, 25. He will speak against the Most High and oppose his saints us, and try to change the set times and the laws. The, saint will be, the saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and a half a time. See, what we said there, the tribulation period is a, is a time, times, and a half a time. There's seven years, and, and three and a half years of those will be a tribulation period. This is 
what the Bible says, 26. But the court will sit, and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever, 27. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints. That's us. It's going to be handed over to us. So these, the kingdoms will still be. This earth is forever and ever. The kingdoms will be. And it says of the whole heaven. Maybe Daniel is seeing even into outer space. Maybe this is going to include even living on other planets. Who knows? Speculation, Jay. You can get in trouble with that. But it, whatever it is, it's all going to be handed over to the saints, which is all the believers. The people of the Most High, if you belong to Jesus, and Jesus is the way to the Father, and He's the Most High, then you're a saint. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. See, everlasting. And all rulers will worship and obey Him. Daniel saw this all in a dream. He was told to translate for King Nebuchadnezzar, while Israel was in bondage in Babylon. You know where Babylon is? Iraq. <laughs> Today, Babylon's still there. Could some people in our time live to see this? But in Bethsaida that day, the people were only aware of a great man in their presence and doing another miracle. <laughs> they loved it. A blind man was healed and could see again, but just a touch from Jesus by just a touch. Does this really happen for us today? People in those days were healed by contact of some sort with Christ. Although Jesus would say it was their faith because they believed enough to touch him or be touched. It was their faith. Your faith has healed you, he would always say. To make contact or touch something impure, impure, would have an opposite effect. In the Old Testament, we read a couple of verses about this. Let's go to the Today New International Version, Today's New National Version, Genesis 3, 3. It says, But God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. Remember that? <laughs> Adam and Eve time. And you must not touch it, or you will die. See, not only couldn't they eat it, but they, they weren't supposed to touch it. How many times have we heard that? And the prophet Isaiah writes in the Today New International Version, Isaiah 52, 11, says, Depart, depart, go from it there, touch no unclean thing, come out from it and be pure, you who carry the articles of the Lord's house. I admit, I'm taking that out of context so you're not getting the whole picture of what's happening there. Except that we're saying, don't touch this unclean thing. And Paul writes in the New Testament, we're taking that out of context too, today, New International Version 2 Corinthians 6.17 says, therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. What are unclean things? Well, that could be another teaching, huh? Or you might want to give it some thought yourself. There were many examples where contact with Jesus brought healing. Today's New International Version, Mark 3, 10. This is, For he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him, pushing forward to touch Jesus. And, Today's New International Version, Luke 6, 19, says, And the people all tried to touch him, because power was coming from him and healing them all. Maybe this is why touching, as we lay hands on someone with the oil, representing the Holy Spirit, is so effective in our prayers for one another today. Then we see Jesus reaching out to touch them. He healed leprosy, fevers, restored sight and hearing, and restoring the ability to stand and walk. In our hearts, we can't 
feel the touch, the edge of his cloak, because there are too many other distractions in our hearts. Too many other distractions and guilt, the self-condemnation. There's too many things today. Everything's on a fast pace. A new car, new this, new that, a new girlfriend, new boyfriend, whatever. New clothes, got to go do this, the new songs, the new everything. Everything's going too fast. And he can't touch us because we pull away. I got to go <laughs> when he tries. In our verse today, it said that people begged Jesus. They begged Jesus to touch the man. Just touch him. Why did they beg? Because they believed Jesus could heal the man, and they put all else out of their minds. I've got a love song. We used to call them back when I worked in the uh, lounges and all that. We called them torch songs. <laughs> well, I've got a torch song here for Jesus. One touch from your hand, and I surrender. My Lord, one gaze into your beauty, and my life became yours. Now I live in all your promises. And nothing seems worthwhile except to be in your kingdom of love. else out of your mind. Faith. <laughs> There's no room for anything else. And they knew without a doubt that through the touch of Jesus would come power from God. We must always stay close to him. Close enough to feel his power. We draw close to Jesus in prayer. Paul wrote to the Ephesians to pray in the spirit on all occasions. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions. And wrote to the Thessalonians to be joyful always. Be joyful always. <laughs> Some people say, why are you laughing all the time? Why are you so happy? You're so giddy and all of this kind of stuff. Is that of God? God is, uh, uh, most people look at Christians as solemn. We're supposed to be joyful always and pray continually continually pray some people say how can we pray continually i i've got to read i've got to study i've got to do this i have to cook i have to whatever no but you can be in an attitude of prayer keeping jesus in your mind all the time right there so you can touch him and he can touch you in everything you do whatever you do it's possible. It's very, it's very easy to do when it's that way. You just keep him there. When something good happens, you just say, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for that. Because I know I could have done it myself instead of taking all the credit. Let's close with the writer of the books, book of Hebrews. And we go now to the Today International Version, New International Version, Hebrews 10, 22. 
says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a, a guilty conscience. See what I say? A guilt can separate us from God. Cleansed from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. 24. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. 25. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. What day? The end of the seven-year tribulation period when Jesus returns. Even Isaiah is talking about it. It's a capital D in the Bible if you want to look at it. The last two verses here were loaded with advice we use daily in our churches. It says not to give up meeting together. Hmm. Many church organizations use this as almost a commandment to attend their church as much as possible. But I see this verse as much more than that. I see it that we need to be meeting with like-minded friends wherever we are. Ones who love God. If they love God, it's wherever they are. Do Jews love God? Do Muslims love God? Yes, they do. They love the Father. The Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Maybe we can show them the way and the truth and the life to the God that they love. And to keep encouraging one another with the good news that the best is yet to come. And we're going to share it in God's kingdom. God bless you. Thank you for being with me again. We'll see you next time. Now I live in all your promises And nothing seems worthwhile except to be in your kingdom of love my lord